Hello, good morning everybody and welcome to another Insider Guides International Student Webinar. Um, so welcome to today's webinar which is Overcoming the Stigma of Mental Health and Why It's Okay to Seek Help. There's been a lot of talk about mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic with really important topics including overcoming homesickness, loneliness, anxiety, resolving relationship conflicts and self-care particularly heightened during this time. The pandemic has been an incredibly difficult experience for people all around the world and we feel it's important to build a safe space to open a dialogue about mental health and to share support systems and services that are available to you. Mental health can be an extremely difficult subject to talk about and for some people there may be a certain stigma that can come along with it. These can often be cultural or generational. It's important to know that research into mental health, along with the accessibility to people, support systems, services and medications that can help are constantly improving and developing as the world changes. As an international student in Australia, you may be wondering where you can access mental health support, whether this is free, how to identify mental health problems in yourself, uh, in yourself or in others, and how to develop positive mental health habits to keep you resilient during difficult times. We'll cover all of these today. During today's webinar, please feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to get to as many of these as possible. Um, thank you to all of our audience members that have already submitted questions while registering for today's webinar. We've tried to sprinkle your questions through today's um, Q&A. Midway through today's webinar, I'll also launch a poll. Um, this will help us learn a little bit more about your opinions towards today's topic and will help inform future webinars. We'll also post a second poll, which will be some feedback on today's webinar. Um, these will be completely anonymous and we'd really encourage you to get involved with those. So to start with today's webinar, I'd like to introduce our wonderful panelists. So I'll start off with Mish. Mish is a clinical educator, newly started in the research and translation team at Origin. Origin provides specialist mental health services for young people aged 15 to 25 who reside in the Western and Northwestern regions of metropolitan Melbourne. Origin's focus is on providing early intervention to young people with severe and or complex mental illnesses. They provide care directly to approximately a thousand new young people every year from the more than 4,000 young people who are referred. Mish is an experienced social worker and family therapist, and she has worked in a range of settings, including schools, universities, and with Headspace, both at eHeadspace and in their schools program. She is passionate about support for young people, both through educational institutions and through family and other adult peer supports. Mish has been learning podcasting as it's another engaging way to share good material and include the voice of others, their questions and resources. So hello, Mish. Hello, everybody. Excellent. So we'll then move on to Neha. Neha is based in Sydney and comes from a business background. She completed her MBA at the University of Technology, Sydney, and it's here that she discovered her passion for mental health. Neha started volunteering with both Reach Out and Batir during her degree, and she started as an employee of Batir in 2017. Over the three and a half years that she's been at Batir, she's worked with school partners across New South Wales and the ACT, delivering and coordinating programs which is also a Batir, oh, and is also a Batir speaker herself, sharing her story of mental health and resilience at universities. Currently, she sits along the program content and delivery team and is leading the program creation of the new Batir at Uni International Student Program. We will provide links for those in the chat. So, hey, Neha. Hi, everyone. Excellent. And finally, we are honoured to have Lynn with us. Lynn is a third year student at Melbourne University, majoring in psychology and criminology. She first heard of Batir through the Being Heard workshop for international students earlier this year. It was one of the best experiences she's had. So she registered her interest to become a speaker and got the opportunity to get involved with all the amazing work that Batir is doing. As an international student, she knows firsthand the struggles and difficulties of coming to a different country to study away from family and friends. And so now we will move on to the Q&A. Um, so we'll be able to hear from Mish, um, Neha and Lynn again. So we'll start off with the first question. This is directed to you, Neha. It's a tough time for so many students at the moment with issues that are particularly heightened when you are far away from your family and your usual support networks as many international students are. What are some of the common concerns that you're hearing from students at the moment? Yeah, 
Thanks, Alex. Um, so looking into the space, um, you know, there's a lot of research that has been conducted and we know from Dr. Mewitt's 2019 study that there are three factors that influence the mental health of international students, which includes dealing with unfamiliar academic environments, such as language challenges and adjusting to different teaching methods and student interactions. Another one is living off campus and learning to be independent in a new country, which includes things like learning how to budget, learning about healthcare and finding employment and providing for ourselves. And also the third factor is uh, speaks to the challenges of reaching out for support um, due to the cultural perceptions and the stigma that surrounds mental health. So over the last few months, we've been holding some workshops, working with international students to co-design our new international student mental health program. And students spoke to these above challenges and highlighted that these challenges were heightened by the pandemic. Um, we're also seeing that in the first time, students that might not have experienced mental health issues in the past are now experiencing them for the first time. And there was a lot of confusion about what to do and where to go. So from these workshops, students voiced that they wanted to feel comfortable and confident leading their mental health journeys. And to do this, students wanted to know more about the Australian mental health system and how to seek support using their overseas student health insurance where and when to reach out for support was also a big one. And really just like the power of like hearing from other young people on their experiences to share their learnings and to share that strategy and have that community approach to tackle these challenges that were addressed. Excellent, thank you so much Neha. So hopefully we'll be able to touch more specifically on um, places where you can go and, and, and seek help. So we'll move on to our next question, which is specifically, uh, what are Origin and Batir doing to support students at the moment? And, and how can students access these programs? So we'll start with Mish. Um, what are yourself and Origin doing at the moment um, to help students? Um, for you specifically, it would be students in Western metropolitan Melbourne. Um, obviously, unfortunately, they're going through another lockdown. Um, how can students access the programs that um, Origin run? Thanks, Alex. I just want to say thank you to Lynn too. I think it was very generous of you, Lynn, to share with us and um, I'm sure your story will be very helpful for hopefully a lot of the people watching. So thank you. Uh, so back to Origin. So yes, our services are, are in the northwest of Melbourne. So that may not be relevant to everybody watching our, um, joining our webinar today. Origin also operates um, headspace centres in those areas, so Werribee, Glenroy, Craigieburn, Sunshine and Melton. So if you're in other areas around Australia, you can look for um, a headspace centre that might be near to you. Um, you can check with your local doctor or search for um, other services online. And you'll see as we go through the webinar today, I've included quite a lot of links to um, ways you can find services in your area, but there are a few um, ways that Origin and Headspace are offering support. You're probably aware the government um, has extended the funding um, at this time so that people can access mental health support more online by phone or FaceTime or Zoom. So that's an option um, to consider that's been more funded, GP services, mental health services, um, People, for people with eating disorders and a range of other supports. And um, hopefully you'll see soon, I've um, put a couple of links to ways that you can find that um, support for yourself. Excellent, thank you so much, Mish. And we'll now move on to Neha. Um, how can students access the Batir programs? Yeah, definitely. Um, so at the moment we're working on um, creating the new international student mental health program um, and we're doing some trials at the moment in Melbourne through online and 
We're holding a couple of different trials over the next few months, and we've also got a EOI um, link that we'll share for students that want to come and see the program and hear more stories and hear about the support services that are available. So that's um, coming up in the next few months. So if you are interested, that's um, available to you and the link is in there. Um, with Batia programs, we have partnerships with universities across Australia, um, mostly the um, eastern coast of Australia. So if you're, if you're part of universities and colleges, you might see um, Batia programs at your college and we definitely encourage everyone to come along and to see one of those programs as well. But this new international student program is the newest one that's coming out and we'll be trialing it in Melbourne first, but then we'll be, coming, we'll be bringing it out to more places. But that particular EOI list that we've kind of um, shared just then is for our open program. So this is available to any international students in Victoria that wants to come and have a look at the program um, to share those resources and to hear those stories. Excellent. Thank you so much, Neha. So I'll let um, all of our audience know that we are posting links live in the chat to everything that our panelists are talking about, but we will also provide a list of everything that we mentioned today and anything that we didn't get to in a write up that will be published on the Insider Guides website. So there will be an opportunity to refer back to the services and support systems that we are speaking about today. So the next question I have here, um, Mish, if you can talk about how has the pandemic changed the landscape for mental health concerns? Thanks, Alex. Good question. Um, I'm thinking about this in terms of challenges and opportunities because it's both, of course. Challenges we're probably more aware of. Of course, the pandemic, as we know, is having a huge impact around the world. It's impacting on work, on leisure, social connections and all those things, of course, affect our mental health. For many people, um, the pandemic has, of course, increased anxiety for their loved ones or for their own health or resulted in unemployment, reduced financial security and anxiety for the future. And all of these things will, um, unfortunately, naturally affect our mental health. So it's a, it's a pretty big thing that we're living through. And, and we know that each individual, we all have varied resources, skills and vulnerabilities. So when you add a pandemic like this to the mix, it's, it's naturally going to have different effects for different people, um, depending on their circumstances. So, you know, it's not one size fits all, but we're aware that, you know, some people are doing it tougher because of other um, uh, struggles or vulnerabilities they might have. Yeah. Some services are, you know, have had to try to respond really quickly to this change landscape and they may have staff who've become sick or who are less available. So there's a struggle for some services. So there may be some increased wait times, hopefully not, because I know there's a big effort in going into making services accessibility, but just be aware, um, don't give up you know, if you do find that um, it's taking a little bit longer, because that is one of the challenges that we're all experiencing. Mm -hmm. In terms of opportunities, um, you know, having said what I've said about the challenges, I'm, I'm very conscious too, we've now got more ways to keep in contact, to get support and find information other than face-to-face -face than we've ever had before and that we've ever had in previous pandemics. So it's, it's also good to remember, you know, that we do have, you know, this webinar is one example, isn't it, where um, in previous pandemics, there wouldn't have been that opportunity to mm. hear from people and share resources. So that does give us some opportunities. And mm. as I said earlier, the government's funding some more online services and trying to increase mental health funding. So there's an acknowledgement by government that... Uh, something like a pandemic is of course going to affect mental health and that we need to do more. Um, more organisations are stepping up to support people as much as they can. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the last thing in terms of opportunities, despite the challenges, this, you can see there's quite a lot of creativity being used to find ways to connect online and um, to try new skills, to do some of the positive things that we know can help our mental health. 
we had a question come through from one of our um, audience members that registered, uh, I believe it was from Libby, and she asked about how the support system has transformed um, and transitioned to cope with the pandemic. And I really like how you just spoke on opportunities. I'm absolutely seeing just in myself and my personal life, you know, webinars about mental health such as these, um, more accessibility online to, to reaching professionals in the field, um, support groups, support forums that are opening up specifically for the pandemic. So obviously it, it has kind of transitioned in the online sphere and we are seeing um, an incredible load of new services opening up um, to not just international students, but everyone in Australia um, and I'm sure around the world as well. Mm. Excellent. So um, my next question is for Neha. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the stigma around mental ill health and what's being done to combat this, particularly amongst our international uh, communities? So this is kind of building off what Lynn was saying in her story. Yeah, definitely. Really good question. Um, so to talk about the stigma, I suppose um, when we initially think about the word mental health, we might immediately find ourselves gravitating towards those experiences of mental illness or mental ill health. But mental health sits on a spectrum. We all have mental health and you know, we can experience days of good mental health. We can experience times of poor mental health. And sometimes we can experience mental ill health, but it does sit on a spectrum. And so this immediate shift towards those more negative experiences or those more challenging experiences is an example of this stigma that surrounds that word and that concept. Um, so in terms of like what's been done and, um, you know, we got to see it today with Lynn sharing her story and sharing her experiences. Uh, in, 20, in 2005, um, Patrick Corrigan put out some research on the best methods to reduce the stigma through this TLC3 approach. And so that's something that we've been doing at Batia um, with our stories and um, with our programs where we're having a targeted local and credible continuous contact with people with experiences of mental illness and mental ill health and sharing those stories throughout the communities to kind of get that word around to really reduce that stigma and to make it okay to reach out for support and this is the same with the new international student program that we'll be um, sharing soon we'll be sharing these stories and um, through that TLC3 approach, um, sharing the experiences and really trying to help reduce that stigma that's already out there. But I suppose like, it's not just a conversation that's happening in Australia. Sharing stories and these lived experiences is a conversation that's happening all across the world at the moment. And so even at Batir, we've been talking to um, some other organizations across the world. Like in Hong Kong, we've been talking to kelly.org um, and sharing our learnings from sharing stories. And it, we also presented um, at the Nexus Global Summit in New York um, recently and sharing those experiences there as well. Um, we've also got a new digital platform that we're going to bring out soon to connect young people and share those stories and to have those connections through a digital platform through an app so there's a lot of things that we're doing and that sharing of that story and sharing of those experiences is a really big part to reducing that stigma excellent thank you so much neha so I'll now pass it over to Mish again. Uh, what signs can people notice in friends, families or themselves that may indicate deeper mental health issues? And leading on from that, when you notice something is wrong, what are your suggestions for how to start that conversation? It can often be very challenging. Um, it can be quite awkward at times. Um, yeah, so what would be your suggestions there? Great questions again, Alex. So signs that someone might be struggling and might have deeper mental health issues sort of cover our, our whole self, if you like. I've divided it up into different things. So someone's mood. So uh, you might notice if someone's mood is lower than normal over time. It's not just about seeming down. It might be someone's more irritable or easily angered. That can be a sign they're struggling. And we all have, you know, 
day-to-day -day variation, but if you notice that changing over time and consistently more negative, then that's a sign. Um, someone's behaviour, so we, we might change what we do if we're struggling. So, for example, if a person normally is quite sociable and would join a, a chat but has stopped connecting or responding, um, that can be a sign too. Um, someone's thinking, so again, all, all um, mental health, we, we can't separate our mental health from our general well-being and self and, and so on. So thinking is a part of that too. So if, if you or someone you know is thinking more ne negatively than they normally do or having trouble concentrating, studying but not being effective, um, that is also a sign. So it's, um, it's well known that anxiety and depression can really affect concentration as well as mood and behaviour. Physical health and well-being. So if someone is struggling to sleep when normally they sleep okay, or if they're not eating well, um, or if their energy is lower, um, sometimes all those things can be, can be something that you would notice. And I've included our spiritual selves. So in this realm, if someone's saying they don't see the point of things when they're normally reasonably optimistic, or if they're struggling with the meaning of life, um, or work or study, that, that's also a sign. So think about all the aspects of ourselves and if you see changes like these um, in yourself or someone else, that, that could be a flag that um, would be a good time to get some help. And the next part of your question was when you notice something and what are your suggestions, how to start a conversation? Um, and... Um, I, just before I answer that, I meant to say that, um, yeah, we, we're used to normal up, up and downs on different days, but it's about the sort of gradual over time um, deterioration where you would be concerned. Um, so conversations, it's true that we're often not sure how to start a conversation, but I would say that your genuine concern and care are the most important steps. And I think Lynn's story really spoke to that, didn't it? That Lynn, you, you really sensed the, the care of both your friend and the counsellor you met, their, their warmth. So even without saying things, people can pick up your attitudes and your, your warmth and care. So don't minimise that. That's a really important um, step to starting a conversation. Next point I'd like to say is don't feel you have to have the answers. Um, people often appreciate someone just asking how they're going. You can always find out more and get back to someone if you don't know what to say. A lot of us are not prepared with answers up our sleeve for every life situation. So, um, again, be aware your care and concern and willingness to support are the key things. And um, one can always find out information and get back to someone. So don't let that be a barrier to you. I've attached some tip sheets, which hopefully you'll see that give some more specific ideas about starting a conversation. Another point is that um, people, as we know, sometimes have worries and sometimes also out of date information about what getting support will mean. So you might um, explore with the person you're concerned for if they have any particular worries about getting help. Um, once you've got a little bit more information about what their concerns or thoughts are, then you can sometimes um, respond to their particular concerns or questions. For example, people often worry, what will I say to a professional? Um, and I would say professionals should know how to help you with that. That's part of their training, but also sometimes simple tips help like helping someone just write down in dot points what, what their thoughts and worries are so that if they go into the room to see someone, they've got something written down. If they're worried they might forget, then that's there. So there's some simple things yep. um, that can help. Um, another good way to start a conversation is to share what you're noticing and why you're concerned. So keep it concrete. 
So you might say, for example, it seems like you're a lot more tired than usual. Um, or lately you've mentioned you're not eating much. You know, it's hard to feel positive if you're not eating well. Can we talk about that? So, so be specific about what you're noticing, which is why you're trying to start the conversation. Brilliant. They're just a few tips and you'll see some other links um, hopefully in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Mish. So we've gotten a question in the Q&A from Renette and it's regarding mental health first aid trainings available to international students who would like to be in a better position to provide support to others in mental health crisis situations. So to Renette, I think um, we will be providing some links in the chat there. So there will be some fact sheets on how to help a friend from Headspace and, and if your friend is not doing okay is another resource and they will provide you with um, more information there. There are first aid courses available to international students, I believe. We can provide links to those as well. Um, a traditional mental health course probably won't touch on mental health um, issues. Sorry, a first aid course won't touch on mental health issues, but obviously there are heaps of online resources available to you if that's something that you are interested in. Um, any one of our panellists, is there anything you'd like to add to that? If there are any courses that students should be looking at? I did. A t I think I sent a link to Mental Health First Aid, mm -hmm. and they are running some online trainings. Brilliant. Um, and they also have a, a very good range of resources on different topics. I mean, we're sending you a lot of material, so yeah, um, not suggesting we'll you'll get all. to all of it, but. <laughs> Um, so that was an excellent you, question. Thank you for that one. So I'll move on to the next question, um, which I'll direct to you, Lynn, um, as you've touched on it briefly in your story. What if a student doesn't want to seek help? Um, I understand that in some cultures, the stigma obviously remains very high around having mental health concerns, as you've discussed. How can we start to break down those barriers from your perspective? Um, thank you for the question, Alex. Um, so what I, what I think I can do is that start the conversation in my social circle first. Mm -hmm. So talk about mental health with my friends. It can just be something as simple as sharing what I know from my psychology lectures. And um, and when I think like when when I'm thinking of my friends, I make sure to make them let them know by you know chucking them a message saying, oh how are you doing? I'm just thinking of you at the moment. Um, just things like that can you know get people around you to open up to you if they if they're not feeling this like themselves sometimes mm -hmm. um so i think i would focus on what i can do for yep. people around me and for myself brilliant yeah and i think starting you know small with your your own social circles is just such an important step that you can take um and it can open so many doors for you as as you were saying you spoke to one friend and then from there you just kept finding solutions um, Mish, uh, was there anything you wanted to add on to that one as well? Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things. It's a really good question. And it's true, there can be a range of barriers, including cultural ones, which we're talking about today. But there might be others, like often people can't imagine or understand how it could help. Um, they might have had a ne negative experience um, previously, or they might be worried about other people finding out and thinking less of them. So there's a range of um, concerns that would apply whether you're an international student or a local. You know, these are quite common concerns. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. So I've got a few tips, but you might, I think Neha might want to add something. <laughs> um, yeah, like I think everything that everyone said, I echo the same. Um, yeah, like, you know, when it comes to help seeking, sometimes depending on where we are at with our journey, we might not be at the stage where we want to openly talk about it. And that's totally okay. And just like Lynn was saying, like asking that question, um, you know, talking about our own experiences, having that door always a little bit open, just in case that friend um, wants to open up and they might eventually, but it, it's just that game of like patience and, um, waiting and being there as a source of support when they want to reach out and when they want to have that conversation. So definitely there's not 
like a perfect time <laughs> for those conversations. It really just depends on where um, the individual is and making sure that we keep asking those questions, making sure that we keep having those conversations and showing our support for when they are ready is what I would suggest. Excellent. Thank you. Jane. And I would just add listening because obviously that's the other side of the coin that it's, that sounds easy, but that takes some effort. So um, be aware that if you ask, you need to give someone time. It might be the first time they've put some things into words. So um, try not to rush in often when, when we're anxious and want to help. It's easy to, to sort of ask a lot of questions, but it, it can be helpful to just really um, slow that down, be very patient as you were saying, Yaha, and um, give them time because they might be putting it into words for the first time. So, Excellent, thank you yeah. so much everyone. So the next question I have is, uh, what services do education in, uh, education institutions provide to support their students? So uh, I'm talking universities and TAFEs. Um, what do they have to support their international students? I appreciate some students may not want to use these services uh, with the concern that talking to someone may affect their studies. Um, so what tips do you have surrounding that, Neha? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so there are a lot of different things that universities and colleges provide. It's very independent to the institution that you kind of go to. Um, you know, last year we did some focus groups, um, you know, alongside Origin to look at, um, to inform like the mental health um, framework for, um, to, for university students. And through that, we... Um, found that like you know universities they've got all these different services and um, it's a great place for international students to go because it's a place that's pretty much free for students to engage in those supports so whether it be the university counseling services which is completely free there um, some universities and some colleges might even have an on-site GP clinic that um, provides subsidized costs or no costs at all so there are some services as well but I think universities and colleges when it comes to seeking support it you know, we talked about a range of services and it doesn't always need to just be the mental health professionals and clinical support, although they're really, really good. There are also some pathways towards that positive mental health. And, um, you know, in the focus groups last year, students talked about those pathways like societies and um, those group, um, group fitness classes and all of those kind of things to really help with their mental health and um, to engage in those group activities, um, engage in those group conversations. And then um, further from that, there are those services like financial services within universities. There are also some um, services like um, the disability service which helps with exam conditions so there are lots of things that universities and colleges provide it's very much just dependent on um investigating um where you're at and which institution that you go to excellent and with the second part of that question which was um students maybe not wanting to use these services with the concern that it, um, talking to someone may affect their studies I might pass this over to lynn i assume you didn't find any issues with it affecting your studies in fact it from what it sounds like it probably would have helped you. Um, so I imagine the concern here would be, I mean, for myself, uh, when I first started counselling, I was afraid that it would take up too much of my time that I could mm -hmm. spend on studying or, you know, finding a job. But um, in reality, it actually helped me. It, um, so I would argue that mental health is the cornerstone of everything you're doing. So you have to have good mental health in order to do everything else. So I, in my personal opinion, it helped me a lot. Like even though I did have to sacrifice a bit of time, um, it does help me a lot in the long run. Yep. Um, but I also know that there are a lot of misconceptions about how um, you know going to a professional might affect your study record. Like they're, they're afraid that it would go official and then the student might be considered not fit for their study in Australia anymore. I would just like to say that it's not true. Um, the university and the services are there to help you. Um, yeah. 
Excellent. Thank you so and much. And they should be confidential. So, um, and that's for international students and anyone and staff. They'll often be helping staff too. Um, they shouldn't be passing on any information. Excellent. So you should be confident when you um, mm -hmm. are seeking professional help. Um, they are there to help you. They're not there to mm -hmm. expose you in any way. <laughs> um, excellent. So thank you everyone for that one. Um, we're now going to um, talk a little bit more on um, the, the situation in Victoria at the moment. So Mish is actually joining us from Melbourne. Students currently in Melbourne may be feeling particularly vulnerable, uh, experiencing yet another round of lockdowns. How can they begin to overcome this anxiety, Mish? Mm. Yes, it's a challenging time for many, many people around the world, isn't it? And in Australia, particularly for us in Melbourne, I should say I'm not actually outdoors in the botanical garden. I'm inside in my house. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's important to acknowledge that um, this is a difficult time, like we, we said earlier, and, and um, it would be normal to be potentially feeling more vulnerable or anxious at this time. But I would also encourage you to notice that you're not alone, that particularly for all of us in Melbourne, we're all impacted one way or another. Um, this is not to minimise the impact on you, but sometimes sharing an experience can be a helpful support. The feeling of being alone is difficult. So while I'm acknowledging it's difficult, I'd also like to keep in mind the shared challenge we're facing and the supports. Um, in terms of general tips, there are a lot of things that can help. And I think we touch on this a bit later and Neha, you talked about it, that our mental health is sort of integral with who we are. And so our general health um, and well-being will affect our mental health. But there are ways that you can support yourself. So anxiety is a normal challenge. It's very common. Um, it's a feeling like other feelings. It's important to acknowledge it. Don't try and push it away or deny it. It usually does fade. Um, avoiding the thing that you're feeling anxious about can tend to make it worse over time. So, but this is an unusual situation where we can't <laughs> avoid some um, news coming into our news feed and that sort of thing. So if you're feeling you're more impacted at the moment because of um, news about COVID or whatever, it might be good to set some boundaries around the time that you're exposing yourself to that. Mm -hmm. um, be gentle for, to yourself. The world's adjusting to a, a new normal at the moment. It's understandable um, that people might be feeling things a bit more intensely or a bit differently. So try to make space for the feelings to talk about them. In terms of the practical things that can help, there are many and they all are related to our well-being mental health, as, as Neha was mentioning too. So keeping up your physical activity, eating well, getting enough sleep, focusing on small things you can control and achieve, reaching out to others, planning breaks, learning new skills, all of those things can help with our mental health and anxiety is the particular topic we're talking about. Yeah. And I, I have added quite a few sort of tips um, tip sheets and things. Yes, absolutely. So we're sharing those in the chat as you, as you were speaking. And again, I'll be, uh, we'll provide them all to our um, attendees afterwards. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. And Neha, the term resilience is used often these days as a skill we should develop to thrive in the complex world. What does this actually mean? It's pretty tough to be strong and resilient when you're stuck overseas, can't get home, um, have lost your job, so you're struggling to pay with day-to-day -day living costs. So in that sense, um, what does, what's resilience? Yeah, definitely. A really good question there, Alex. Um, look, I think when we talk about resilience, we think automatically about, you know, bouncing back. But for me, when I think about resilience, I've kind of changed this definition a little bit. Um, and for me, what I think about resilience is knowing what works for you, knowing what makes you happy um, so that it helps you bounce back at your own pace, um, especially when you're going through a tough situation. And, you know, I've been in that experience myself where, 
you know, you meditate and you um, look at all these different self-care habits and something tough happens and suddenly it's hard again. And you think that by doing all these things that you're going to bounce back um, quicker and stronger, but that might not be the case. Like it's still going to hurt when we're going through those tough situations. And even right now, like we're experiencing something so unique. So when it comes to resilience, uh, it's like, you know, it's having that toolkit of um, strategies and things that makes us happy, um, that works for us, that we can lean on in these times when we're feeling that isolation or the pressures and loneliness um, that surround us in this pandemic. So for me, like, you know, when, when it comes to resilience, especially in those situations, leaning on those smaller actions, you know, we talked about, um, Mish, you talked about how like connecting during this time, like online has been a really big support to do that, like making sure that we're connecting across borders, um, that we can still chat to our friends, even if we're stuck at home. Um, resilience and self-care doesn't need to be big revolutionary things like, you know, fitness every single day or meditating every single day. It can be like when in Lynn's story, um, when we've got something on our mind, talking to somebody that we trust, these little actions can help with um, building our resilience and help us bounce back at our own pace, especially in these tough times that we're experiencing right now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Neha. We've only got five minutes left. Um, we obviously want to end on something a little bit more positive, a little bit more actionable and practical. So to you, Mish, uh, what, are, what does positive mental health look like and what can people be doing to make this a daily habit? We've actually had a question from an audience member, Sahar, who has asked for practical techniques and activities to improve mental health on a daily basis. Mm, great. Very good question and good point. And I think Neha and I've touched on this a bit, our, our mental health is part of our overall well-being. It's not separate. So, you know, people may have mental illnesses, but even then they can um, put into place practices that will support them. And they're the only ones that can do that. You know, even if you get professional help, your choices, even about the little things, can make a big difference. So, it, and as Niha was saying, it doesn't have to be huge things. The best thing, we call them practices because the idea is to do them regularly. So even if it's a small thing, you know, a five or 10 minute work, walk each day, it's better to be doing it each day than aiming too high and not doing it. So sort of the daily um, um, habits are really important. Um, so think about, um, taking regular breaks, keeping in touch with family and friends, eating well, planning activities. Even now we can do that. <laughs> Even if we can't see people, we can see people virtually. Um, you can use your devices to set alarms to yourselves to remind you to take stretch breaks, to go outside, to eat, to chat for a friend, um, talk to family and friends. Um, develop new skills, like there's a whole lot of cooking and craft things online. So now, or music, you might learn a mus musical instrument. Anything that's positive that you might enjoy, that's um, a new thing to learn, that breaks up your day, um, and anything that relates to our general well-being, so our physical health, um, whether that's exercise, having a relaxing bath, giving yourself or someone else a back rub. Many little things can help. And I think I've included a quite a few tip sheets there yep. that'll give you some other ideas. Excellent. Thank you, Mish. And um, to Neha and Lynn, was there anything else you wanted to add on to that? Po little positive ways that um, international students or anyone listening really can improve their mental health on a daily basis? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, Mish, you've talked about some really um, great resources there and um, definitely those apps. There's also a app directory on reachout.com that um, students can go and have a little look. There are apps ranging from mindfulness, meditation to like, you know, 
putting together tasks and prioritizing and um you know lynn you talked about in your story about allocating that time to worry and then to move past it there are all these Great ideas apps. yeah so there's all those kind of apps there and um the reach out website is a really great place that you can kind of see all of them and you can go through all of them. Most of them are free as well. Um, so that's something that can help in this current situation. Excellent. I've added just a couple of things because all those apps and tech things can be super helpful, but in case they're having some challenges, like in case they're sending you lots of negative news or fake news or interrupting your attempt to concentrate. There are also some good resources that can help you limit that um, so that you set a boundary for yourself. Okay, I don't need negative news coming in all day. I'll set aside five minutes for it. So I've attached some uh, links to some resources that can help you um, cut down the negative as well. Yeah, excellent. So just quickly, everyone, in the last few minutes, I, I appreciate this is just going a little bit over time. Um, I've just launched our poll and we'd really love you all to get involved um, in the last few minutes, if you could do that. So this is really going to help us kind of summarise what we've learned today and seeing where you're all at, how you're feeling about this. Um, so you should have that poll pop up on your screens now. Um, I'd like everyone to know that all of the apps that we're talking about today, all of the resources that our panelists have been mentioning, all of these are going to be provided in a list. Um, I think one thing just finally, very quickly at the end that would be interesting to jump on, um, Neha, um, while study remains largely online and students are seeking opportunities to make new friends, where can they go to do this? So we're focusing a little bit less on, you know, more clinical mental health, where can people just connect and chat? Yeah, definitely. Um, look, I think, you know, we're in a situation right now where we're ex like, we're experimenting with technology. We're trying different things. And, um, when it comes to universities and colleges, they're doing the same. They're holding events where um, people can get to know each other and get to mingle online um, at the comfort of their home. And um, one of these events that, you know, Batir runs is um, called the Feast of Strangers. And so we run this at universities. It's kind of like speed dating, but you're meeting new people. So you get a list of questions. Um, there's an entree, a main and um, a dessert mm -hmm. set of questions. And you kind of answer these questions and you kind of, um, you break out into little breakout rooms. So you have that one-on-one -on -one opportunity to meet somebody new, to talk to somebody, have those connections. And that's a really great way that we can um, still remain connected and make new friends when we're in um, this online environment and facing that isolation. So that's one of the ways that we can do it as well. Um, also, there are lots of um, like campaigns and um, initiatives happening as well. So I know another one that we've kind of done recently is Run for the Herd. It was a virtual running festival and we couldn't run together, but it was, you know, if you wanted to walk in your neighborhood or go for a run with a friend, posting that and sharing the stories and sharing the messages and why we're doing this. It just creates that bit of connection. You're sharing it with your own networks and then we're also sharing it with ours. So it creates that opportunity to connect with people and, you know, universities and colleges are doing that as well. So I really encourage mm -hmm. students to um, engage and like look out for those kind of things because there are those opportunities happening and, um, more and more they're like we're getting used to doing this online so they're just a couple of examples they're great examples and i would say you know now is a great time to join in those things some people are not so sure not very confident maybe about joining in but at the moment um, particularly if it is something run by your uni or a tier or something like that um, push yourself slightly outside your comfort zone and have a go at some new activities like that and join in. Yes, excellent. Very good, good options. Thank you so much, Mish. Um, brilliant. 
thank you so much um, to everyone on that final question and thank you to everyone for holding on for just an extra few minutes. So um, you should all be seeing the poll results now shared on your screen. I think it's really interesting. We had 46 of our respondees saying that financial concerns were one of the biggest barriers to reaching professional help. Again, as we were saying today, there are so many free services out there and that's just a really good step in the right direction. Um, so please don't think of that as a barrier between you and, and just improving your overall well-being. Um, these poll results will also be shared with everyone so you have an opportunity to read through those. Um, so we'll just bring today's webinar to a close. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Um, mental health can be a really difficult topic, but we hope that this has provided some clarification and given you the confidence to seek um, or provide help and support where needed. Um, all of today's resources will be published in the post-webinar write-up that will be published on the Insider Guides website, along with a recording of today's webinar. So you'll have an opportunity to go back if there's anything you want to re-listen to, or if there are any friends that um, couldn't make it today, you're able to send them today's recording. Um, I would also like to extend an enormous thank you to our amazing panelists, Mission Niha, for your um, expertise and um, your insights and for Lynn, your um, experiences. And thank you for sharing such a powerful personal story. Um, it, it evidently resonated really powerfully with our audience there. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I'd like to let everyone know to keep an eye out for um, our next webinar. So just keep an eye out on the Insider Guides website and our social media channels for that. And uh, please stay safe, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.